Good morning. Such an obedient crowd. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome to the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. I'm Dean Reuter of the Federalist Society, and I am very pleased that such a large and distinguished audience has joined us for this, the Federalist Society's 35th anniversary National Lawyers Convention. <laughs> welcome also to those of you watching on the live feed. I'm also happy to report that our registration numbers uh, for the convention this year exceed last year's numbers by a wide margin, and last year was a very good year. And uh, the dinner, the annual dinner this evening, will be a record breaker in terms of numbers of people attending. So uh, well done to all of you, and thank you for being here. Now, each year, as you know, our convention features a substantive organizing theme typically centered on first principles. This year, no exception. We examine the regulatory state in our showcase panels, discussing the regulatory state's interaction with each of the three branches of government in turn, and considering its implications for the structural constitution and the separation of powers. Fifteen breakout sessions, addresses, and debates will carry that discussion forward, looking at the regulatory state in various substantive areas of the law and much more. So fasten your seatbelts, and again, thank you for being here. We begin, to get to begin this morning, we welcome U.S. Senator Tom Cotton. Many of you know the good senator from Arkansas, but you might not know that he recently sat for a series of interviews with The New Yorker, which resulted in a lengthy article out just this week that you might not have seen. The article includes this curious line about Senator Cotton, and here I'm quoting. He's improved somewhat as a speaker. <laughs> There's more. He's improved somewhat as a speaker, even if he still projects more intelligence than warmth. <laughs> yeah. I read it the same way. Uh, so I'm not certain, but I, I, I read that as a criticism, the New Yorker finding Senator Cotton guilty of projecting too much intelligence. So I've, I've never gotten that line myself. but. Uh, the, the New Yorker, I, I'm sure then to demonstrate just how one can stop projecting too much intelligence, helpfully goes on to describe the leitmotif of Senator Cotton's political career. And I will pause and let you all look that word up on your smartphones if you'd like. But only the New Yorker can accuse someone of projecting too much intelligence in one paragraph and then in the next word, in the next paragraph, drop the word leitmotif. So. Kidding aside, uh, Senator Cotton is a sixth generation Arkansan who was born and raised on his family farm in Yell County, Arkansas. That's a great name for a county. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He's also a former clerk to Judge Jerry Smith. Well done, Judge Smith. Uh, he practiced law at Cooper and & Kirk and Gibson Dunn here in Washington, D.C., but he left the partnership track to serve his country, not as a lawyer, but as a, as a decorated soldier, completing combat tours in both Iraq and Iran. I'm sorry, Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> sorry. My, yeah. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, there might have been a frolic there, I don't know, but uh, with, with the 101st Airborne. Now between those combat tours, I think this is important, he served as a platoon leader with the Old Guard at the Arlington National Cemetery, and that's the unit responsible for military honors funerals. In 2012, he was then elected to represent Arkansas's fourth congressional district, and in 2014, elected to become a U.S. Senator. He's obviously had a remarkable career to this point in time. We're very pleased he could be with us. Please join me in giving him a warm and intelligent welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for the very warm welcome. Dean, thank you for the very kind introduction. So kind, in fact, that even now I am excited to hear what I have to say today. <laughs> It's great to be back with the Federalist Society to see so many friends and familiar faces. Dean, it's good to see you. Uh, Leonard Leo, my old friend, a uh, great champion for freedom and limited government. Um, as uh, Dean said, we have Judge Jerry Smith and his wife, Mary Jane, who's a longtime 
mentor to me, put up with my hijinks as a young lawyer. Um, I was such a good young lawyer, I had to quit and become an Army soldier. Um, but uh, I'm really, truly am excited to be here with you today. It's uh, an exciting time for the Federalist Society to be celebrating your 35th anniversary with a new Republican administration in Washington. And you know, I, you can clap for that. <laughs> I, uh, I, I was a member of the Federal Society uh, when I was a student and then when I was in private practice, so I've long supported what you do to spread the gospel of freedom and constitutional government to the benighted backwater lands of our nation's law schools. Uh, my, now, my affection for the Federal Society has also become very personal. Uh, I met my wife at a Federalist Society lunch, and uh, my wife Anna is here with us today. She. Uh, Now, she, her retelling of, of that encounter would be long and twisted and have lots of turns and mutual friends and take an hour or so. My recounting of that story is very simple and 100% accurate. I gave a speech and a pretty girl gave me her phone number afterwards. <laughs> Must have been a hell of a speech, right, honey? <laughs> she hates it when I do that, by the way. So believe me, there are, there are few people uh, who hold the Federal Society in as much esteem as I do. It is a great institution, uh, and it's a uh, true honor to be celebrating your 35th anniversary with you. Uh, along those lines, I'd also like to welcome everyone to Washington who flew in for this conference. Uh, I hope this conference inspires you to go back and be successful in your legal careers. Unlike me, if you don't, you might end up as a politician. You know, there's an old joke about elected officials that when you di disagree with an elected official, he's a politician. When you agree with him, he's a statesman. <laughs> but whatever you call him, uh, an elected official's perspective on the administrative state is a little different than most. Uh, perhaps the most frustrating thing is that so many people agree that it's a problem, yet so few people do anything about it. Lots of good men and women run for office and come to Washington, D.C and they run headlong into a recalcitrant and stubborn, arrogant federal bureaucracy. And this has sometimes been referred to as the we be problem, I'm talking about the permanent bureaucracy, the permanent staff, the self-described residents who look at the 537 people who are in Washington because they won an election and consider them to be tourists. And they say, we be here when you got elected and we be here when you're gone. Well. It's important to remember, though, that as much as we might express some frustration about those bureaucracies, about those regulatory agencies and the people who fill them, those bureaucrats didn't create themselves. And the last time I checked, they're not in the Constitution, not a single mention of them. Nope, every single one of them was created by a law which means by a Congress who is willing to abdicate a degree of its constitutional powers. It all started innocently enough First, Congress began to defer to federal agencies on factual questions, reasonable steps. Then Congress began to empower those agencies to fill in the details of a regulatory scheme. But then in the 20th century, Congress began delegating vast power to federal agencies to achieve only the most vaguely defined goals. Think of the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. Now, the appeal of this approach to a bunch of politicians should be obvious. It's far, far easier to create an agency or delegate authority to an agency and take credit for doing something than it is to pass a law, an actual law with real consequences for which you might be blamed. Then, when the agency makes what is in effect a law a few years later, you get to condemn the agency for overreaching. You get two bites at the political apple. What could be better for a politician? I can tell you that once Congress stumbles onto a path of least resistance like that, it doesn't stop, it plows straight ahead. So at, at this point, there are so many federal agencies, nobody even knows how many exist for sure. It's true, they're competing estimates. Maybe 60, 89, 115, 257, 316. Nobody really knows for sure. And the sheer number of regulations has skyrocketed over the last century. 
The first Federal Register was published in 1936, and it clocked in at a whopping 2,620 pages. Passed 10,000 pages by 1942, 20,000 pages by 1967. Last year, it passed 95,000 pages, which represented a 15,000 page increase over a single year. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> by contrast, some of the most fundamental laws in our nation's history are just a couple pages long. The Northwest Ordinance, 2,900 words. The Homestead Act, 1,400 words. Those were big and important pieces of legislation, and they shaped our country in fundamental ways. They continue to shape our country to this day. So it's not necessary that we pass 1,000-page bills that nobody reads and empowers hundreds of bureaucrats that nobody elected. That's a choice. It's a choice that our elected officials have made. And if anything, what's necessary is that those elected officials do their job once again. And this isn't just an academic debate that's confined to the pages of some law review that nobody reads. No offense, anyone. <laughs> the American people are genuinely fed up with the administrative state. I can tell you that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And the stories of waste and mismanagement would be funny if it wasn't your money and your freedom. Who could forget the IRS's $4 million conference, $4 million in Anaheim, complete with videos of IRS employees performing a parody of Star Trek and the Cupid Shuffle. And there was TSA that spent $47,000 to create a single app. What about the ATF spending $600,000 to buy six drones that it later found out didn't work? Or the USDA telling a family that they needed to get a license to display their llamas. And CMS shelling out $1.3 billion, $1.3 billion on 300,000 claims that had been previously dubbed medically unnecessary. That's just a small sampling. And I admit they actually are pretty funny, but they're very serious as well. Because this is the arrogance of the administrative state. They're so removed from public opinion, so unaccountable to the people they're supposed to serve. They look at long and terminal wait lines at their offices and probably think, ah, that means job security for me. They, they think they don't have to treat the people who are their bosses with the respect they deserve. They send edicts down from on high to the masses as if they're handing down the Ten Commandments, except in this case it may be called the Ten Thousand Commandments. Now, I don't mean to condemn people who work in our federal government. I'm not saying that they're bad people. I'm saying that they're people. The Federalist Papers, I think, reminded us that men are not angels. And that's why when men are invested with power, that power is supposed to be representative and limited and separated, none of which it is in our administrative state today. So what should we do about that? Well, fortunately, we now have a president, after eight years, who feels the same way about the administrative state as we do, and long has. And he's willing to work with Congress to reverse this trend. Now, I, I know that some in the media and the Democrats, but I repeat myself, <laughs> claim that they, they claim that the president is some kind of nascent fascist. But let's just take stock of three notable cases that they also complain about. First, he stopped paying to insurance co companies subsidies that had been held unconstitutional by a federal judge. And he asked Congress to authorize those payments. Second, he rescinded 
the law, unlawful Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program, and he asked Congress to reach a new compromise. Third, he decertified the Iran nuclear deal, which had circumvented the Constitution's treaty clause. In each case, and there are many, many others, he reined in an out-of-control executive branch and told Congress to do its job. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound exactly like the pattern, pattern of a budding authoritarian to me. And ultimately, it is Congress's job to fix the administrative state since Congress created it in the first place. This year, we've made some good progress on that front. Using the Congressional Review Act, which the media and the Democrats, but I repeat myself again, sometimes described as obscure or little used, you know that we must be doing something good because they only call things obscure and little used when they don't like the way it's being used. We've repealed 15 of the Obama administration's midnight regulations. And that doesn't simply repeal those regulations. It salts the earth over them. Those agencies can never return to that topic again until Congress passes a new law. And, and building on that, we've asked the Government Accountability Office to review what you might call camouflage regulations, guidance, or dear colleague letters, or advisories that are masquerading as something other than what they are, binding regulations. And if the GAO finds that those things are effectively a regulation, then Congress will be able to vote on them as well and overturn them too. And finally, we're at least beginning to have a serious debate in Congress about the organic statutes that created many of these agencies and vested them with the sweeping authority they already have. Now, I will admit, though, that there is one area in which the Senate has been painfully slow in making progress, painfully slow, and that's the confirmation of executive and judicial nominees. And that's all because the Senate Democrats simply refuse to accept the results of the 2016 election. They don't have the votes to stop the president's nominees. That's their own fault. Because four years ago, to pack the D.C. Circuit, through a simple majority vote, they overturned the rules of the Senate and required not 60 votes, but a simple majority vote for the confirmation of all executive branch nominees, all district court nominees, all circuit nominees. We use that same precedent to hoist them on their own petard this year when we confirm Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. So that means it now simply takes a simple majority vote to confirm any nominee to any office in our government, which to be frank, was the custom or the standard all along until just 15 years ago when a junior senator from New York named Chuck Schumer decided that it would be in the Democrats' advantage to start filibustering George Bush's nominees. Think about it. Clarence Thomas was confirmed by a vote of 52 to 48. Any senator could have demanded a 60-vote threshold, but none of them did. Not Ted Kennedy, not John Kerry, not Joe Biden, not a single Democratic senator took that step until Chuck Schumer came along. So they don't have those votes anymore. But what can they do? They can use, or I should say abuse, Senate procedures to try to delay confirmation votes as long as possible. That enables bureaucrats to run their own agencies without any political accountability, and it slows the president from being able to nominate in the Senate to confirm new judges to our courts who will hold those agencies to account. These abuses are unprecedented and they must come to an end. I can assure you, I can assure you that the patience of Senate Republicans is fast wearing out. Things are going to come to a head in the next few months. And I have three simple proposals to bring them to a head. So listen up, all you aspiring U.S. attorneys and federal judges. <laughs> this is going to make a difference. First, blue slips. Some of you know that for the past century, the Senate Judiciary Committee has extended a simple courtesy 
to its members. Whenever the president nominates someone from your state, the Judiciary Committee chairman asks for your input by sending you a blue slip. It's literally a blue slip of paper that you then return with your thoughts. Recently, though, the Senate Democrats have simply refused to return their blue slips. Senator Al Franken, for instance, has been holding up David Strass, who was nominated to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals back in May, and we've confirmed many other judges who were nominated on that day or subsequently. The Democrats are claiming that the blue slip should operate as a unilateral veto. That is a gross abuse of the blue slip custom. It, and remember, it's nothing more than that, a custom, a courtesy. It is not a rule. It is not a law. And it was meant to facilitate consultation between the executive branch and the Senate, not obstruction. There's no way, there is simply no way we can allow a single U.S. Senator from a single state to decide whether a nominee can even get a vote, even get a vote for a court that covers three or four or five or six, or in this case, seven states, including my state of Arkansas. So I agree wholeheartedly with what Senator Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, said earlier this week, that we cannot allow a single senator to veto a circuit court nominee. So, either, so either, the Dem, either the Democrats return their blue slips in a timely fashion or we simply proceed without them. After all, as I said, the blue slip is a courtesy. It's not an ironclad rule. And if the Democrats want to abuse that courteous, well, maybe we, maybe we ought not be so courteous in return. Second, another way the Democrats are trying to throw sand in the gears of confirmation, in this case of judges, is insisting that the Judiciary Committee wait until the American Bar Association completes its evaluations of nominees before holding a hearing. Look, we should just stop pretending, <laughs> just stop pretending that the ABA is a professional organization in this context. Whatever, whatever else the ABA may do in other contexts, in this context, they are a left-wing ideological enforcer. Yeah. They, they've, already, they've already deemed four of the president's nominees to be unqualified after eight years of never calling a single Obama nominee unqualified. But then again, why should that surprise us? They were all Democrats, and these are Republicans. The, the ABA is a democratically unaccountable special interest organization. Stamp of approval ought to carry no more weight than any other such organization. After all, shouldn't we care about, say, the National Federation of Independent Businesses opinions on these nominees. They're the ones that bear the costs of left-wing judicial activism, after all. So the Senate Judiciary Committee is wholly in the right not to allow the ABA this kind of privileged status, and we shouldn't give the Democrats a single concession in return. Now, Finally, and in my opinion, most outrageous, Senate Democrats are abusing the confirmation process by forcing multiple votes, even for non-controversial nominations, and running out the entire clock for every vote. Here's how it works. The majority files what's called a cloture motion to end debate on a nomination. Then there has to be an intervening day before the vote on that cloture motion. And then, after that vote, there's up to 30 hours of debate before the actual confirmation vote. That's 30 legislative hours, not 30 actual hours. And I assure you that no debate ever occurs. 
when the minority insists on that entire process, every vote, all 30 hours to run, it can take a whole week just to confirm two or three nominees, an entire week of the Senate's business. There was a week in July, for instance, where all we did in an entire week was confirm an administrator in the Office of Management and Budget, a district judge in Idaho, and the ambassador to Japan. I would never dispute the importance of the district court in Idaho. We have a, maybe we have a judge from Idaho. But I would point out, I would point out that after those multiple votes and after 30 full hours of debate, that judge was confirmed by a vote of 100 to nothing. I would never, I would never dispute how critical an ally Japan is, one of the great powers of the world. And Bill Haggerty is a fine ambassador to Japan. But after all those votes and after all that time, he was confirmed 86 to 12. This is nothing but the purest, most rank obstructionism, and it's unprecedented. Let me just give you the contrast. This year, this year, the Senate Democrats have forced us to take 47 cloture votes. 47. Well, what's that compared to? Over the last four administrations combined, the last four administrations combined, by the same time, there were only six cloture votes. That's a simple tactic that they've used, and unfortunately, it's been a pretty effective one. Through the end of last month, the Senate had confirmed 180 Trump nominees. That may sound like a lot until you realize that it was 219 fewer than it confirmed for President George W. Bush and 187 fewer than it had confirmed for President Obama through the same point in their presidencies. So it's time to put a stop to this now. In January, <laughs> a simple proposal. In January of 2013, the last time the Senate was seated with the Republicans in the minority, Senate Republicans agreed to a unanimous consent order that expedited consideration for nominees throughout the remainder of the 113th Congress. That set a standard by consent of 30 hours of debate for cabinet and Supreme Court and circuit court nominees, eight hours for all sub-cabinet positions, and two hours for district court nominations. I'd say that's pretty reasonable. So I would give the Democrats this choice. Either they accept those exact same terms, or the Republicans, by a simple majority vote, will change the rules of the Senate, we will eliminate cloture votes for all nominations, and we'll set debate for every nomination for all offices to two hours. So, so they, they have the choice. They have the choice, except the same reasonable terms that the Republicans accepted in January of 2013 when we were last in the minority, or face the Senate equivalent of martial law. <laughs> now, because if, if we are serious about reining in the administrative state, we have to be serious about stopping this unprecedented obstruction and confirming good men and women to our executive branch and the federal courts. The, the Supreme Court has finally started to pare back some of the bureaucratic overgrowth that's accumulated over the last century. And the courts are growing more skeptical of the administrative state's claims of unquestioned authority and alleged claims of deference. And if we want to continue that trend, then we cannot allow the Senate Democrats to attempt to nullify the results of the last election. Elections must have consequences. But, but whatever, hap whatever happens, I know one consequence the Democrats can't avoid is the continued and growing influence of the Federalist Society on our nation's laws and our court system. So I want to thank you all again for what you do for our country. Thank you all for allowing me to address you this morning to kick off your conference and wish you the very best for an exciting and informative conference. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you. 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 So, uh, so Dean tells me we have, uh, have five or ten minutes, uh, so that's definitely not enough time for me to bring Anna on stage and descri have her describe how we met. It would take like 30 minutes. But uh, I think we do have time for a few uh, questions or comments, um, and then if uh, we run out of those, we'll move on to insults, if that works for everyone. I have a question. I think we have a gentleman over here. Yes. Uh, I'm Steve Calabresi. I'm the chairman of the Federal Society's Board of Directors and a co-founder. And my question is, uh, will the Senate pass the RAINS Act, which is a bill that passed the House of Representatives, which would require that the House of Representatives and the Senate approve of any agency regulation that the Congressional Budget Office estimates will affect the economy by more than $100 million? Uh, this would do something significant to rein in the delegations of power to the agencies and to shift power away from the agencies and the president and back to Congress where it belongs. I'm a fan of the RAINS Act. It's technically unconstitutional as it passed the House because <laughs> Uh, in, order to, in order for Congress to act, it has to present to the president, and the president has to sign the bill under INS against Chada. But changed uh, RAINS Act, which required House and Senate approval and a pre the president's signature before an agency regulation that affects the economy by more than $100 million, would by itself really cut back on delegations. I wonder if it could be added to the appropriation funding the regulatory agencies for this year. Yeah, uh, Steve, first off, thank you uh, for your long years of service to the Federal Society and what you've done to create this institution and make it what it is today. So, uh, so I, I too am a strong, strong supporter of the RAINS Act. I've been a sponsor of it. I voted for it in the House of Representatives. Um, I, I hoped last year after the election that we might be able to make some real strides in reining in the power uh, of the administrative state um, with Donald Trump in the White House because Republicans still believe in it as a matter of principle. Democrats would be scared of what Donald Trump might do. Um, so far, that hasn't proven the case. Uh, in fact, the Democrats say things to me that are just kind of mind-boggling when you juxtapose them. So on one day, um, they declare that Donald Trump is a budding authoritarian. On the next day, they want the federal government to start confiscating weapons. <laughs> Those don't really seem to, seem to go together. <laughs> um, but the RAINS Act, I, I think, would generate much sounder, more sensible regulation not only because Congress would have to vote on these regulations and would have to take accountability, but because the regulators would know that they have that backstop. And it would probably produce better regulations coming out of their shops in the first place. Um, I, I don't think we yet have eight Democrats who are willing to join us on that. Um, I s suspect that we could get the president's support. As I mentioned in my speech, there are several instances in which the president has basically ceded authority that President Obama had claimed back to the Congress and told the Congress to do its job under Article I, um, including it in an appropriations bill or some kind of major budget agreement is an option as well. Um, but you know, it's got, I think, near unanimous support among Senate Republicans. It's really just a matter of trying to convince those Democrats that the shoe can be on the other foot sometimes, and they should want to have an opportunity in Congress to pass judgment on these matters. But as, as I mentioned in my speech, some of that is about political survival and opportunism as well. You know, they're often happy to let the regulators make what are the essential public policy trade-offs, which is why they delegated that authority in the first place. Just as a follow-up, could the RAINS Act be added to the budget bill as a rider appropriating funds for the regulatory agencies for next year? Reconciliation bills wouldn't be filibusterable in the Senate. I, I don't know if it could be added to uh, a reconciliation bill. I mean, I know it could be added to any other bill uh, that has to pass, you know, whether it's a funding bill or on p legislation that sunsets and so forth. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm a Mike Dory, CEO of LabMD in Atlanta. And uh, how, do you, how do you think you'll be able to achieve your goals from what I see as a very weak understanding by the public of the administrative state because it's not even in civics? I mean, I, I've said when I speak that we haven't had an honest civics book in a century. 
So that, for example, um, when you fight in a straight state, which you have no knowledge of even exists, uh, you learn the hard way that you can't even get an Article III judge. And that is the work of Congress. There's a way to chip away at that, and, and how would you achieve these goals without letting the public be educated on what's going on? So in my experience, you know, dealing with uh, the people of Arkansas as an elected official over the last five years, it's pretty simple that they still esteem the Constitution even though they hold big government in low regard. They, they still believe in the founding principles in this country. You're right that they may not be taught as well in high school civics as they used to be, but most of them have some kind of lived experience with federal bureaucracy or, or state bureaucracies as well, um, and they're not real satisfied with that. Just, I mean, as an or, ordinary, everyday American, I mean, think about the three agencies with which you deal most, the post office, the TSA, and the IRS. Not exactly models of efficient customer service. <laughs> and, and in your particular jobs or your hobbies or what have you, you almost always come into uh, contact with other federal regulatory agencies, whether it's the EPA or OSHA or the Forest Service or the Park Service or what have you. And I can tell you that there's a lot of dissatisfaction in those experiences. Not every single one, not every single one, especially whenever you're dealing with people on the front lines who live in your community and who are part of the fabric of that community but still there's a lot of friction. And e even if high school civics is not what it once was, in my experience, most Americans still hold the Constitution in high regard. They hold big government in low regard. Yes, Roland Bueller with the Madison Coalition. Thank you, Senator, for your support of the RAINS Act. Um, but as you mentioned, there are some constitutional issues with the RAINS Act. And because it has a $100 million threshold, it does not necessarily protect regulations that impact Second Amendment rights or religious freedom. And that's one reason why two months ago the Republican National Committee, in a resolution that was dictated word for word by the White House, endured, endorsed something called the Regulation Freedom Amendment, which is a constitutional version of the Reigns Act. And the idea is that in the same way that states persuaded Congress to propose the Bill of Rights without a convention and the same uh, for presidential term limits uh, about 60 years ago, that if you could get two-thirds of the states to support a popular amendment, you might be able to break the deadlock and force Congress to support it. And in fact, 26 legislative chambers uh, have uh, approved past resolutions endorsing the Regulation Freedom Amendment, including a resolution in the Arkansas House and a letter signed by a majority of members of the Arkansas Senate my question is, is this something you might be interested in leading? You're one of the top leaders in, in the fight against the administrative state. Would you consider a leadership role uh, in this regulation for the amendment? Well, well I, I appreciate your kind words on that. Uh, there are a lot of others in the Senate uh, who are leaders on this issue as well. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I, I've only read about it at the highest level. And frankly, you've helped inform me more so than I had been, so I'll study it more carefully um, in general. I am somewhat reluctant to move forward with constitutional amendments. I think we have a pretty good constitution already. We just need judges that do a better job of upholding it, which is the direction we're moving right now. Um, but I'm happy to take a look at it uh, and study it more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Dean is cutting us off. I am cutting you off. All right. Thank you all very much. Have a great conference.